Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Have you ever felt stuck in your Christian life? Have you wondered if the abundant life Jesus promised is really available for you right here and right now? Our next guest will help you identify the spiritual growth barriers that are keeping you stuck and show you the way to experience more of the abundant life, a life characterized by more love, joy, peace, and hope than you ever dreamed possible before. Ken Ball draws us into the inner workings of the brain and the heart that inform how we process negative and traumatic experiences, and that can also be diverted from health and wholeness by such negative experiences. How we process hard things intellectually and spiritually recalibrates us towards either health and wholeness or bitterness and defeatism. Ken helps us rewire our brains by simmering in the scriptures that remind us whom we belong to and what God has promised us. The end result is a resilient, robust faith that is prepared to weather every storm and keep us in step with Jesus. Ken Ball was a successful pastor before a crippling experience of burnout disrupt, disrupted his career and set him on a journey to, a better, un, to better understand the dynamics of spiritual health. With a doctorate in ministry from Talbot Theological Seminary, Ken is the founder and CEO of IDT Ministries. Joining us now to talk about his new book, Unhindered Abundance, Restoring Our Souls in a Fragmented World, is Ken Baugh. Ken, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Eric. It's great being with you today. Well, it's great to have you with us. You know, you started out the book with your early years, and that's where we want to start with you, because that's what shapes and forms much of our theology, our experiences, and in fact, uh, Dr. Mark Baker has spent 25 years uh, as a psychologist <clears throat> who has found the link between shame occurring early in life and sin patterns and responses to that shame. And we know that this occurs at the heart level and not the head level. So yeah. take us back to your early years because they were formative in both shaping the good, uh, some of the negative, and then what the impact was through your pastoral career until it finally all came to a head. Yeah, those early years are so... Uh shaping of our worldview, of how we understand ourself, how we understand God. And when there's when there's trauma that we experience in those early formative years, and I would say those years are, you know, probably zero to twelve is a really important time frame. And during that season, my parents, who loved me and did the best they could, uh, got divorced, so I was five years old when they got divorced. And then just the the challenge of trying to go between two homes, then they, they both remarried, and then you have blended family dynamics. Uh, my stepfather was very emotionally unavailable, although he loved my mother and was a good provider. Uh, and my dad was, uh, more emotionally available, but just extremely busy with work. And so even though our parents do the best they can, we don't get the nurturing and the empathy and the uh, the heart needs met uh, that, that we have. And that creates damage that doesn't just go away over time. And I think that's a really important aspect to, to realize is that there's this saying that time heals all wounds. Well, the reality is time alone heals nothing. And so uh, people resist, in my experience, I've been a pastor for 30 years, people resist this idea of going back to the past and processing and working through this stuff, but they don't realize that there is a foundation that has been laid. There's roots that go into the soil of our, of our heart or our life, whatever metaphor you wanna use, that is going to affect the fruit that that comes out. And so I, I really have been on a journey personally, which is the impetus for the book as well, of getting to the source of things that are troubling me as instead of just dealing with the symptoms. 
You know, Ken, on the journey you take us, and, and it was a back and forth that ultimately led you to live with your grandparents and, and relocate and then relocate back to California. And uh, the journey is somewhat of a ping pong ball between families and acceptance and rejection. Uh, you give the, the example of, uh, of excelling at basketball and thinking that was going to endear you to your teammates and wound up re building resentment because you replaced one of their buddies and you were the new guy. And that set up a time where uh, the team was not the team. It was the team and then there was you. And once again, you were kind of on the outside. And so here was this setup that you were disconnected because of uh, mom and dad divorcing, uh, two families, then living with grandparents for an extended period of time, then trying to reintroduce yourself back into the family dynamic. And that can breed a great deal of rejection, isolation, uh, the emotional uh, traumas that wind up determining personalities, our response mechanism to stimuli. Anger. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a special here every month on journey into the divided heart, and we've found 40 different defense mechanisms that come out of the divided heart. Uh, aggression, anger, uh, rage, <clears throat> uh, and you actually do a lot of self-examination uh, as to what your triggers are and what you found that you needed to work on. I often tell people that when I got saved, uh, my mouth didn't get saved for five years and my brain didn't get saved for 10 years. So uh, I still said the things I always said, then I stopped saying them, but I thought them. And uh, it took 10 years to cleanse the mind where mm -hmm. I didn't have that response mechanism when somebody cut me off on the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, as we journey into this, uh, there are some uh, truths that, that you address in here, and one of them was the experience of your pastoral career and facing a time when you were well, terminated, you were mm. let go, uh, yeah. you were successful, <clears throat> but the presentation to you was that you weren't the guy that was going to take them to the next level. but. As you examined that, you began to realize that that wasn't really what was at play here. What was at play here was you. And when yeah. you did the self-reflection, you began to examine things in yourself that, as God will do, if we let him, what mm -hmm. the enemy would mean for evil, God would work for his good so that many would mm -hmm. be saved. Uh, he took you on a journey. Tell us mm -hmm. about that journey in that first the first response, first reaction to what you describe as burnout, but was it really burnout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it was burnout, but I think what causes that is important to get into. And it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying just a couple of moments ago, is I believe God has placed the need to belong deep in the human heart. And it is, I think it's like a homing beacon that every human being has that is drawing them, that God initiates to draw them to himself. And they can choose to reject it, they can resist it, and all of that. Uh, and many people do. Those who respond, uh, right, that's part of the path unto salvation, of to declaring Jesus as Messiah. Uh, but the rejection and abandonment that I experienced early in life, right, the, the roots that were there, and then that was reinforced over time through these other experiences that you mentioned, it, it just exacerbated this need to belong, and I just never felt like I did. And so you always feel like you're on the outside, and that is lethal to the human heart because we need connection. God created us as relational beings in his image and likeness, right? That means a lot of things as we know, but one of the things that means is that we are relational and we need connection with him and others. So fast forward now to uh, my last church, church ministry assignment. 
I'm the senior pastor. It's a large church. I have a large staff. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of demand. There's a lot of expectation. When you step into the pulpit, you can't be hitting singles, you know. So there's there's this pressure that you that you experience, and there's a fatigue, emotional and physical fatigue that uh, just takes place, and you find yourself kind of running on fumes. And if you don't know how to take care of your own soul, which I did not, that's not something I was taught in seminary. That wasn't even a a mindset, right? That wasn't part of my worldview as to what it means to be a pastor is caring for your own soul. That I just, I just, I just got depleted and I had just run on empty. So I started deferring some of my leadership responsibilities. Uh, I wasn't dealing with conflict in a really healthy way because I'm agitated. I'm impatient. I'm frustrated. I, cause I'm just exhausted. And my wife saw it two years before, uh, before my my termination and just said honey you know you're running on empty you need to slow down you need to get some help here and i was just like i didn't feel like i could slow down and this the just the demands of ministry were such that and my need to belong my need to be wanted my need to be needed was what was driving all of that uh really that pace that led to this exhaustion that did lead to burnout. But again, burnout was the symptom of that deeper problem. And that's what this, these last six years, this journey that I've been on has been so personally helpful to me. And then in those that I coach, because I can bring that experience to bear. It's so interesting. There's a line from the Wizard of Oz that says, excuse me, Pay no, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And, <laughs> and yet, uh, in ministry, uh, we do a very, very jo- bad job of paying attention to the man behind the curtain. And Absolutely. I've often said that there was a man behind the rabbi, and the man behind the rabbi was not um, shepherded, was not cared for, was not, it was, there was always this certain arm's length you had to have uh, certain boundaries to keep from, and especially the larger you grew, uh, the more insulated you had to be because if you were also counseling, then if you become too close, then there's that familiarity, uh, you lose a lot. And there's also divided loyalties, and uh, some are loyal to the man, and some are loyal to the vision, but finding people that are loyal to both uh, becomes difficult. So your leadership can be very fractured. Some are very loyal to the vision, but they are not loyal to the leader. Some are very loyal to the leader, and they're not loyal to the vision. And that brings within the own, the structure of, of the organization itself a certain fracturing, which makes it very hard to connect with because you're trying to play uh, a leader in divided agendas, trying to get people to come into unity, uh, which is very difficult to do the larger you get. And people don't realize that there is uh, a needed support system uh, for the pastor. Oh, that is so, so well said and so important, which is why, you know, half of my whole coaching clientele are pastors. And it just provides them that safe place to just talk things out and to process. You know, Paul talks about, you know, bearing one another's burdens and weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. There's, we have this need for empathy and it goes back to that connection. Somebody who gets me, somebody who understands what I'm going through, they see me in what I'm experiencing and they're willing to be with me in that without judging, criticizing, condemning, rejection, rejecting me. And that's what actually starts bringing back in this this joy, if you will, that drives us, and the competing the competing demands, the expectations, the pressures, the financial dynamics uh, of all of this, and then I had a philosophy of ministry uh, switch in my own mind in regard to you know I've been a pastor for so many years and just seeing so little change even in my own life i hate to admit even in my own life but people would come into my office and they would say please tell me there's more to the christian life than this and the this that they were talking about was 
one more sermon series, one more campaign, one more mission trip, one more program. And it's not that any of those things are bad in and of themselves, but those things don't get to the resolution of the things that hinder us in our character and the greater experience of the abundant life that Jesus has made available to us. And so, so much of the way that we do church, I fear, does not lend itself to the character formation and the greater experience of the abundant life, partly because of the pace and the expectations and the performance and all of that. But I hate to say it, I think a lot of our pastors that are leading our churches, especially in North America, are just not very emotionally healthy. And that's a bad combination. You know, as I look at the church today, and I come by, I came to faith out of the synagogue at two weeks before my 45th birthday. So I have, I have uh, 25 years of living the believer's life and 45 of the non-believer's life. And one of the things that became very apparent to me as I began to study this new believer's life and what quote-unquote Christianity or life as a Jewish believer was like was the absence of what I consider to be authentic worship, which authentic worship in a Jewish mindset is liturgical and it requires you to turn your eyes within and examine your heart as you are reciting passages of scripture uh, that are preparing, that are breaking up that hardened ground that all week long you've dealt with the world. Now you have to separate yourself, leave the world behind. And it's very methodical. The, the, the pattern of removing yourself from the world and entering into the presence of God is to enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, and then enter the Holy of Holies, bowed down low in worship, which means my eyes aren't on looking at a screen. My mm. eyes are closed and turned within and preparing mm. myself to receive what God has for me. But we've gotten into this pattern of follow the bouncing ball. Your eyes during worship are on the screen, not on yourself. And so how can transformation take place if you're, if, if you're, not rem if you're the same person when you walked in the door 35 or 40 minutes later, you're still the same person. There's no transformation that's taking place where you've been able to divorce yourself from the world and enter into the presence of God so that you, the pastor, can deliver the Word of God and have it be seed on fertile ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen that as a pattern. So in my own congregation, mm -hmm. we, we didn't do it that way. We had worship separate from praise. Mm -hmm. It were two distinct experiences. And the altar was open during that time. And people did find transformation and healings and uh, mm -hmm. many counseling appointments afterwards from what was revealed to them in that time. And so... Uh, I've coached and counseled many who say, you know, why, why was what you did so effective? And I said, because we didn't do it the traditional way. Praise was completely different than worship, and in the Bible mm -hmm. it is different. And mm -hmm. we've gone into this methodology and this kind of systematic program of what a Sunday morning looks like. and. It's a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. And we don't yeah. serve a God that's one-size-fits-all. We serve a personal God that the only size that my God is is my size. The only size mm -hmm. that your God is is your size. Uh, he, he meets us where we are. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, I do these uh, five-day encounters at a ranch in southern Montana. And the rhythm of the day is uh, teaching and time alone with God and then time processing together in small, small groups of uh, four or five guys. And what I've noticed is that it takes, uh, usually it takes about 24, 24 to 48 hours for them to kind of detox, if you will, from this frantic, you know, consumed 
thinking of just all the stuff that's going on to where they're able to now walk through the woods and hear the birds and the squirrels and speak to God and be in his creation, right? So that general revelation dynamic. And I've been doing this now for 11 years, and we've taken hundreds and hundreds of missionaries, pastors, and uh, Christian businessmen through this five-day ex discipleship experience. And just the intimidation that a lot of these guys feel uh, because they're on the ranch for an hour and we've got them out alone with God before dinner. And it's just like, what am I going to do, right? I'm just going to sit there and, you know, for 10 minutes and then I'm going to be bored out of my mind. But as the week progresses, uh, it's that time alone with God that has become so, des they're, they're so desiring that. And Eric, at the end of every, every encounter, we have an evaluation and the number one, I kid you not, the number one thing is I needed more time alone with God. So it goes right to your point that for us to become aware that God is right here with us, he's Emmanuel, he is right here with us, he is closer to us than our own breath, we have the spirit of God within us, but we're so distracted, we're not paying attention to that. So how in the world can we hear that still small voice of the Lord speaking to these places in us that lead to that self-reflection, that lead to repentance, that lead to a, a new realization of the intimacy that we have with God through Christ. Uh, those are missing components, it seems like, in the way that we do church today, which I think is part of the reason why we're seeing the anemic uh, uh, Christianity that we're seeing, at least in North America. The Bible gives us a model of a Sabbath, of yep. a period, an entire day, from sundown to sundown, on whatever day it is you might want to take that Sabbath day, and it is to be in the presence of God. And if you do that, and you are faithful to it, then you will personally have that kind of encounter. But we've moved this to Sunday, uh, and we've made it into an hour, hour and a half, and then you go about your regular day, and it's not really the Lord's day, it's the Lord's hour and a half. And we've allowed that to perpetuate because of pressures and convenience, but we're really not doing anybody any favors by giving them uh, uh, spoon-fed message and if I were to say to you how do you want to age what, what do you want to have in old age is I'll be 70 on my next birthday and people say well, you know what do you want your later years to be like I said, well like my 94 year old mother who can feed herself and take care of herself and play golf and and get out and do things and I, I want to live a dignified life but yet we we don't want to have somebody feed us, but yet that's exactly what we expect the pastor to do, mm -hmm. is to feed us, and you don't get nutrition by taking one small meal a week, and that's exactly the expectations we've put on the pastor, is that you have 35 minutes to deliver yep. me such a rich meal that it will last me for seven days until I return again on Sunday. And that's not heart healthy, that's not physically healthy. And as we begin to look at this connection that you have clearly demonstrated in the book between the brain chemistry, the heart chemistry, <coughs> and the interaction between the two, that unless we are fostering a heart of flesh and fostering a circumcised heart and fostering that thought center and feeding it, a healthy diet rich in antioxidants and rich in nutrition and rich in those things that God has given us to make us healthy spiritually, emotionally, physically, they're all interconnected, but they yeah. all start with the heart. Yeah, the heart is that it's it's the the CPU. It's it's the operation center. <laughs> of all of life. I mean, Solomon, Proverbs 4.23, right, is that guard your heart, for from it is the wellspring of life. And that word guard, as you know, um, 
means more than just protecting it from something from bad television shows or what have you. There's a cultivation and intentionality built into that word. The di- that di- the dynamic range of that word is that you are caring for your heart. And we haven't done a good enough job, I don't think we've done a very good job at all, at helping people understand the importance of the heart. We do this at the ranch. That's our primary focus. We talk about the heart quite a bit in our teaching because that is central. And so my book comes at growth in character, which I refer to as Christ formation, from a holistic standpoint, that it's going to uh, be, it's going to involve our material self, our bodies, right, and our immaterial self, which the Bible refers to more often than any other term as the heart. It's that the essence of who we are. And God has given us the free will to be intentional about seeking him and cultivating that heart and abiding in Christ that there's you know there's this effort if you will that is involved this intentionality that doesn't minimize grace in any way it these are grace sustained efforts if you will to cultivating that heart but for some reason and this is I think uh, Eric goes back to part of my termination some of the elders that I served with were getting afraid that the terminology that I was starting to use in my discussion of discipleship was too ethereal it was it was borderlining on the new age and it didn't have as concrete lines around it that they were comfortable with and I on, honestly I think that was ultimately I don't I don't think it was a leadership issue as much as it was a a concern that I might be leading the church in the wrong direction. Mm. Such interesting dynamics when you interact with people. Uh, It's often been said of ministry, this is a wonderful job if it wasn't for the people. (laughs) And so, so, uh, you know, the... the, uh, attributes of a leader and what expectations are placed naturally and unnaturally on the pastor to be the uh, messenger and the healer and the answer for all questions uh, does not foster a move, a shift from the boxed in entrenched theological dynamic that when you examine the entirety of scripture it is holistic it is embracing all aspects of this it it involves things like meditating on the word this is not Mm -hmm. the Hare Krishna meditation this is the meditation on the word that is biblical and time alone with God, time alone with God's word. All Mm -hmm. of that creates those kind of patterns. And unfortunately, we've done these word associations that if you say meditation, uh, now I automatically say, well, oh, that's a new age concept. And we've taken it and we've kind of gone back 2,000 years to a Roman Greco philosophical point of view saying, well, that's not good. Uh, because the Bible is much more structured than philosophy. Uh, yep. But uh, the influences on the writers of the Bible were philosophers, were philosophical. I mean, John, John's own word in the book of Revelation are exactly how they describe Zeus when he said mm-hmm. that God who is and was and is to come is are the exact words that Zeus was described <coughs> as. And he mm-hmm. deliberately selected those words to talk to people that understood it in the context that the God he's talking about is greater than Zeus. And you have to understand the contextual foundation of what was being written in order to really understand why it's written the way it is. We're talking with Ken Bob, author of a new book called Unhinged Abundance, Restoring Our Soul in a Fragmented World. We long for more. And yes, there is more to the believer's life than just what you are experiencing. 
And when we look at the studies that only 6% of the body of Messiah in the Western Church has a biblical worldview, we have done a poor job of connecting you with the essence of God's Word and the experience that He has carved out personally for each one of us. A journey into something exceedingly and abundantly beyond all of our expectations. But it requires full contact with the Holy One of Israel. We have become spectators and not participants. But there's a real connection, and the connection is at the heart. And when we come back from break, we're going to dig into that heart connection. And Ken is going to show you how, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, out of the abundance of the heart is the reflection of our thoughts and our feelings towards ourself and towards God, and how we can reshape that to live life and live it more abundantly. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, host of Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Revealing Prophecy, seen every week on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Our daily on-demand programming is available on our Apple and Android apps and on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. We broadcast live Monday through Friday through our apps on our website, IgnitingNation.com, and on Facebook Live. You can listen daily on our audio platforms on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, and iHeart. Our lineup of best-selling authors bring you the most in-depth biblical insights into the most pressing issues of our time, including prophecy, Israel, spiritual warfare, and a wide variety of contemporary Christian issues impacting the body of Messiah around the globe. If you missed the live show, you can always catch up on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Follow us on social media and join us as we endeavor to heal the nations with the Word of God. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to study right by my side through the Biblical Truth Library. Imagine having access to over 1,000 hours of audio and video teachings available to you through our website on a subscription basis or via our Apple and Android apps on an a la carte basis. Whichever method you choose, we promise to deliver new insights into the living Word of God as seen through the eyes of a Jewish believer. If you hunger and thirst like millions around the world for a deeper walk with God and the revelation of new understanding of the Scriptures, visit IgnitingNation.com and click on the Biblical Truth Library or on any device with our free app. Don't let another day go by without receiving your heart's desire for a new depth of understanding into all of God's Word. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and my special featured guests twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black for in-depth insights into Israel prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. Shalom. 
I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Ken Baugh, author of the new book, Unhindered Abundance, Restoring Our Souls in a Fragmented World. Ken, welcome back. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Ken, when did you become interested in this intersection of brain science, spiritual formation and understanding that God had always intended the heart to be the thinking center of our spiritual existence. Yeah, because when you look at those different pieces, it's like, how do you put the, all of that together? It, it really is the result of my doctoral work. So when I was writing my dissertation, I wanted to get to the source problem as to what what was really hindering people from experiencing the life that Jesus has made available? Because I didn't think that the abundant life was something we had to die and go to heaven to experience. There was something we were missing here and now. And so I had a, I had a strong background in psychology from my seminary training and you know all my years of experience in ministry and such as well. Uh, and so I knew where, I knew where uh, psychology could help inform us in regard to our understanding of discipleship and how change takes place and so forth. But the more I kept going back to scripture, I kept seeing that there's something going on with our thinking, that our thoughts have to, because there's so much emphasis in that over and over and over again, right? You know, Romans 12, 1, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 4, whatever is good, lovely, pure truth, think about these things. Colossians 3, set your hearts on things above. I just kept seeing this over and over again. And I'm like, there's got to be a connection between uh, our brain and our hearts, if you will. And as I started doing my research, that's when I started discovering, oh, wait a second, there's a whole discipline of neuroscience here that uh, I had not been exposed to. And so as I started diving into that and studying that, I started kind of connecting the dots and going, oh my goodness, uh, God, of course, God knows how he created us to operate. And when we bring ourselves into alignment with that, we're going to experience a different result. And so it was really the, the, the fruit of my, uh, my research and doctoral work and my dissertation that kind of opened my eyes to all of this. And so the book, Unhindered Abundance, is really the, the popular version of my dissertation. You know, it's a, it's a much more readable, di obviously, uh, uh, dynamic than that. But that's, that's kind of how it happened. So in your investigation, what did you find that, and, and you were the guinea pig of your yeah, entire literally. experience. You, you were yeah. literally trying on these uh, new ways of thinking, new ways of processing, and you began to see transformation in yourself that those areas of burnout, those areas of sensitivity, those areas of woundedness and isolation and rejection were now being shifted in such a way that you were removing yourself from one power source, which was negative, and remaining the same person, but plugging yourself into a new power source, which was the Word of God and the relationship that you have on a personal level and you began to see some dynamic changes in yourself that made this all very real and personal. Yeah, I think 
So there's three dynamics of the heart that I started really exploring from a scriptural standpoint, <clears throat> thought, emotion, and will. And over and over again, both Old and New Testament, those are the three dynamics of the heart that play out. And what's interesting is that you can't control your emotions directly. You, do, you can influence them indirectly by what you choose to think about. You can't, uh, you can't influence your will directly long term. It's unsustainable, right? So just think of your last New Year's resolution. How long does that last? But what we can control is our thinking. And what's interesting is that what we choose to think about is then going to produce a consistent em an emotional response that's going to influence the will. And all three of those, like gears in a car's transmission, drive behavior. So again, when we're looking at some kind of behavioral change that needs to take place, the issue that is going on in the behavior, let's say it's drug addiction or pornography addiction or what have you, that's not the problem. It's a problem for sure. But the problem is what is going on in the heart that is driving this problem. And it doesn't take away personal responsibility or, or it doesn't minimize sin or any of that. But what it does do is it gives us a more comprehensive way of seeing our part in our sanctification that is uh, that is largely the work of the Spirit, but we partner with him, it's a limited partnership, but we partner with him in that regard to bring about uh, that change. So as I started realizing that I can control my thinking, at, shortly after I was dismissed from my position as the senior pastor, uh, I just went into a tailspin of depression and anxiety and <clears throat> I just I thought my whole world was over and I was in a bad place. I wouldn't sleep at night. I was up early. It was just it was terrible. And my wife, Susan, had been uh, memorizing Ephesians. She actually memorized the entire book of Ephesians and I watched her go through that over the two years that she was doing that and how that was changing her. And so she and I decided to memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17, which is a great text to memorize. And I would find myself, when I would wake up in a panic at 2 a.m. in the morning, instead of entertaining all of those cat catastrophic thoughts that we're going to lose our home, where I'm never going to get hired as a pastor again because getting fired doesn't look good on a resume, uh, I would start going over Colossians 3. And before I knew it, I was waking up the next morning. And so... It was experimenting with disciplining my thought life, informing it with scripture, and letting scripture be what I was saturating my, my mind in. Now, I've been a pastor for 25 years, my goodness. I have a high regard for the efficacy of scripture, right? I mean, I love God's word. And yet I was experiencing his word in a very personal way that I hadn't experienced it before. And so I had realized that I had preached sermons on trusting for God to provide, but what was broken in me was my, my believing that God would provide for me. And that goes back to the systemic things that were going on in my past. You don't belong, you're not good enough, right? All that shame that you referred to earlier uh, is was, was still there holding this stuff together. And so it was a process, but I've been dismantling that over these over this period of time, and it's producing a different result. I'm still in process, right? That's a lifelong journey, I believe. But I think we can make more progress than we ever realized. So interesting that, that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17 all the way through 6.10, this dynamic of this new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, and then he goes on to tell you that I uh, do what I not to do and what I should do I don't do, and I still have this struggle with this thorn in my flesh, and I still have these battles that are going on, and so it's, it's very real. It's not a destination, it's a journey, and unless we embrace it, and it is a path. And, you know, Jeremiah, God speaks to Jeremiah, and says, when you come to the crossroads, choose the ancient path, and there you'll find your peace. Well, that ancient path is to go back to what Jesus said was the greatest commandment. When you f read the whole passage of Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, uh, which was in the Jewish mind, if he started with 6-5, you finished it with 
the, the rest of the thought because that's how we're trained to do it. That's how we're taught the Torah is that the, the rabbi will start the passage with three or four words and you'll finish the rest of the passage. That's how we learn uh, Hebrew and the Torah. Uh, so knowing that he would use the same principles that he was also trained and taught the same mm -hmm. way. And so it says you are love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you are to be on your heart and you are to talk about them uh, teach them to your children and talk about them when you lie down and when you rise up and when you walk along the way. And of course, he said he is the way. And so when we begin to connect the way, the ancient path, what is this? Then he's telling us that the narrow gate, once we go through that and we then are not as influenced by the external, but we are now more, more influenced by the internal, dynamic relationship, that that's where real transformation takes place. And in Levitical, all the way through, cleansing is the process. You have to be cleansed. That is a part of the repentance process. That is the part of the sanctification process. That's the part of the justification process. The, the redemption process is a cleansing. So you have to wash away. Uh, I tell people, I don't want to be the 20th person in the baptismal. I don't want to be immersed in 20 other people's junk and sin. I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I want to be the first one in, first one out, leave my deposit. That's why we deposit, that's why we in, in Judaism and in Messianic Judaism, in a moving body of water because it washes mm -hmm. that away. It takes it from you and you are that new creation. That's that new birth, breaking through the water again. But in this case, what you have to do is you have to set your, it doesn't set, <clears throat> set your mind, but you have to set your heart. Heart, right. And if you think about it, everybody who's ever accepted the Lord knows this truth, that if you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But it doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. But yet it is the pathway to salvation. It is the declaration of salvation. It is the clear establishment that if you believe in your heart. And so that is the center. Mm -hmm. And the heart drives the mouth under, out of the abundance right. of the heart the mouth speaks. So that's, that's all interconnected and you've given us this, this scientific and neurological connection between the heart and the brain, between emotion, uh, the soulish experiences, and then how to embrace the power of the spirit which is resident within us. It's this gift that Jesus gave us the Comforter, the Paraclete, the mm -hmm. Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of God uh, that empowers us and when we become partners with it, we can affect real change. You open up the book with, with, with a, uh, a story of a, a, a woman who could not forgive herself. And I, I want to talk about that for just a minute because if God has forgiven me and I can't forgive myself, am I not putting myself above God? Is that not a form of pride? Yep. And yep. yet people struggle with self-forgiveness. They struggle with mm. trying to remind God of things that he's, and I think we have a misconception of once to die in the judgment, because as believers, we haven't been taught well to know that this is not a rehashing of that wretched life you led before you came to faith. That that old life is gone. And yeah. the sins that you've committed, that you've repented of, have been cast as far as the east is from the west. So when I stand before the Lord on that day of judgment, what, what is going to take place? is a reward, is a, is a blessing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a time mm -hmm. of, of those, those jewels in my crown and not to be feared, but to be embraced as saying, wow, what I do in my believing life matters to God. It should matter to me. And that is a heart shift 
that has to take place. And this is the emphasis of your book is this heart shift that really needs yeah. to take place. Yeah, and I think, I think there's too much emphasis on sin and not enough emphasis on walking in the Spirit. And I don't say that to minimize sin by any means. But again, someone who struggles with forgiving themselves, there is, there is some distortions going on there as to what is grace, what is God's love, you know, has, is my sin been declared by somebody to be, you know, the worst sin of all? Uh, I often find it ironic that we have our pet sins in the church, but I've never seen a list of sin include greed and gluttony and <laughs> some of the things that God says, these are the things that I hate. And so, you know, we create this hierarchical list of sin so that if I've committed that sin, oh my gosh, you know, that's more egregious, whereas sin is sin. And yes, there may be different consequences for sin, earthly consequences. When I confess my sin, I am forgiven. And the penalty for that sin has been taken care of at the cross. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So there is a freedom now that I can walk in I have a new identity. I am a new creation with a new identity in Christ that if if I don't know that, if I'm not learning about that, and if I'm not uh, meditating on those truths, it's, it's not going to have the same outcome. And so that's why my focus is not, again, not on minimizing sin. Sin needs to be confessed. It needs to be repented of. But let's help people walk in the spirit. Let's help people, because mm -hmm. from brain science, the, that which we focus our attention on is what we move toward. So if we're constantly beating ourselves up about the sin that's already been forgiven, right, that was that was nailed to the cross, it's gonna just pull me down this, this road of despair and anguish and depression and, you know, shame and fear and all, the, all that stuff. But if I'm focused on who, who I now am in Christ, what Christ has done for me, this intimacy now that I have with him. I mean, John 17, we have been invited into the Trinitarian community. It's just mind blowing that that's what I think is going to lead people into a place of experiencing the abundance of love and joy and peace and those things that I talked about, that I talk about in the book that then help to free us from all the stuff that keeps us stuck. Well, it's time for us to get unstuck. And it's time for, yes. the body, for the body of Messiah to stand firm on his word, to transform the world around them. But the transformation begins within, as all change. Lord, let there be change, but let it begin with me. And this is a journey in unhindered abundance, restoring our souls in a fragmented world and guiding you through an understanding of what's happening inside of you so that you can clear the pathways to allow God to work intimately in your heart and in your life. Ken Ball, thank you for sharing this with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Eric. It's been great being with you. I really enjoyed it. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.